Hello, I'm Gideon Litchfield, and I write a newsletter called Future Polis. In it, I ask the question, what would it look like to reinvent democratic governance today in the 21st century? My central thesis is that there is already a very large but very loosely connected community of people working on this problem. And my goal in Future Polis is to write about them and the things they do and how all of those efforts connect together. One of the first things I did was to try to map out this community and its activities. And what I'm going to share in this video is a first draft of that map. I've divided this problem of governance into six rough spheres of activity. As I said, this is a work in progress, and I'll be giving you some information at the end on how to offer me feedback. The first of these spheres is what I'll call autocracy prevention. It's about shoring up the existing political system, fixing the bits that are clearly broken. It's things like reducing barriers to voting, preventing cyber attacks on voting infrastructure, making elections more secure, tweaking the electoral system to make it better represent the people using ideas like ranked choice voting or fusion voting. Improving civic education, especially for kids. Preventing gerrymandering and other forms of manipulation. Or reforming campaign finance. Now, this is a pretty US-focused list of problems, but some of them apply in other countries too. Autocracy prevention is really where the vast majority of efforts in saving democracy right now are focused. It's where the funding is, it's where the attention is, but it's not a major update. It's more tweaking the systems that we already have. My next category is democracy reinvention, and this is probably what most people think about when they think about the future, the long-term future of democracy. A lot of it is about creating more ways to give citizens a part in decision-making outside of elections. So this includes, for example, mini-publics, which is a casual term for citizens' assemblies, citizens' panels, juries, and other kinds of bodies that give people a way to deliberate on policy issues and reach consensus. There's participatory budgeting, which is when a local government sets aside a part of its budget for citizens to directly decide how to allocate. I've also included crowdsourced lawmaking here, which is when you use an online platform that lets a large number of people reach consensus on policy proposals. Taiwan, for example, pioneered this to set laws on online alcohol sales and ride-sharing. Then there are forms of civic engagement that don't apply to government, like platform cooperativism, which is a form of economic governance where the users of a platform, like, say, photographers or small retailers, are also collectively its owners, rather than it belonging to a wealthy company like Amazon. Then there are various rather out-there experiments in blockchain-based governance, which I haven't frankly seen work very well so far, but there is a very big community interested in them and experimenting with them. All of these things that come under democracy reinvention already exist, but the vast majority are pretty isolated experiments at the local level or in very specific communities. My third category is what I call government effectiveness. And I think of this as a kind of upstream to downstream thing. The upstream part is agile policy making. Basically, how do we make legislation and policy move faster and iterative in response to rapid technological change instead of taking years to write laws and then not change them for decades? If you think about the AI Act in the European Union, for example, when it was first being drafted, it didn't, didn't include anything about generative AI. When ChatGPT exploded, they had to update the act. And in the next year or two, there are probably going to be other AI innovations that the Act didn't even contemplate. Downstream of agile policymaking is how the government builds or procures its own technological infrastructure. And then how it uses that infrastructure to digitize its own operations. Downstream of that is how that it translates that digitization into citizen-facing public services like online portals. And finally, how government makes data more open so that the wider public and other institutions can use it and build platforms and services on it. 
My next bucket is policy. This is a bit of a grab bag. There are probably some things I'm missing, but I wanted to think about the kinds of policy changes that the Industrial Revolution brought about, like worker protections and antitrust and social security. A lot of those policies need to be updated for the technological revolution that we're going through today. So, for example, labor law has to change to encompass the gig economy. Antitrust law needs to be updated, is already being updated, to take into account the particular qualities of big tech platforms, like, for example, the fact that network effects and therefore monopoly are actually central to their business model. We need new tax policies. Perhaps we need to shift more taxation to capital and away from productivity. Also, we need to work out how to tax work done by AI and robots since they don't pay income tax or payroll taxes. AI and tech regulation in general is obviously a huge and rapidly evolving area. And then there are things like universal basic income, which is another proposed measure to compensate for an automating and rapidly changing workforce. My next category is peace building or overcoming polarization. I think this is an important area, though I don't have many items in it. Again, I'm sure I'm missing some things, but this includes conflict resolution, which speaks for itself, and deep canvassing, which is a method of helping persuade people and change their opinions by listening closely to where their opinions are coming from. Last but certainly not least, I've got the issue of the information environment that surrounds us and contributes to polarization. A big part of this, obviously, is how to fight misinformation and disinformation. Another is creating digital public spaces that are not owned by the big tech platforms or designing recommendation algorithms for platforms that don't maximize for engagement, for time spent on the platform, but instead for utility, for what you get out of the platforms and whether these methods can reduce toxicity and polarization. Another arm of this is how to create sustainable business models for journalism, which have been repeatedly undermined by big tech over the last few years. In here is also copyright law, because training generative AI models on all the content in the internet is forcing us to completely rethink what it means to copy and use someone's work and therefore how to compensate people when their work is used in this way. Finally, I've also got free speech law, because when free speech doctrine was first created, the problem was that speech was expensive and easy to suppress. Today we have the opposite problem. Speech is very abundant and easy to spread, and so the problem is not that speech is suppressed, but that bad speech is drowning out good speech and preventing the spread of good ideas. So this is the complete map, and as I said, it's a first draft. There are some overlaps between some of these spheres. You could argue for some things to be in different places. No doubt there are some areas I've forgotten. But this is what in, is in my mind's eye when I think about the issues that I'm writing about in future polis and how they connect together. So what is the point of all this? I think of all these different spheres of activity as a movement that doesn't yet know it's a movement. And my goal in writing about it is twofold. First, I'm hoping that by drawing the connections between these topics, I can help this movement see itself more as a movement. And second, by highlighting interesting stories of what people are doing, I can help show the wider public that there is hope here and that we don't have to be stuck with these governing systems that are no longer serving us well. I write the newsletter Future Polis to cover these issues. And I could use your help with a couple of things. First of all, subscribe, read it if you find it interesting, share it with other people. Second, look at this map, contribute to it, give me feedback on what could be better, what am I missing, what do I need to change? And finally, offer me ideas for stories. Send me things that you have come across in the future of governance that you think would make interesting stories for me to write about. Thank you.